My name is uh, Larry Warren, and in December of 1980, I was assigned to the 81st Tactical Fighter Wing here in Suffolk, East Anglia, uh, at the NATO air bases Bentwaters and Woodbridge, a twin base complex at the time. And I was a security specialist, and that meant I worked with uh, securing the arsenal, the nuclear arsenal we secretly housed here at that time, tactical weapons, battlefield grade, uh, against terrorist attack. On December 11th, 1980, my security clearance, known as PRP, came through and I was approved for it. And my clearance was a secret clearance at that time. When it comes to the uh, UFO incident that took place near RAF Woodbridge, which is our sister base, six miles apart, separated by a pine forest known as Rendlesham Forest, uh, I was into my second week in, on the flight line working the night shift. Uh, we had just come off a break. Uh, the previous flight, sea flight, had, I did not realize this, but on boxing night, boxing day morning, uh, early in the hours, uh, two nights before my event, uh, because I was off duty and things were clamped down, what happened is, is that a security policeman named John Burroughs and an airman Parker we're at the east gate of RAF Woodbridge, that fa and if you look from the gate out to the forest, it's a pine Corsican pine forest. Beyond that, about uh, nine miles away, is the Orford Quay and the, the North Sea with the Orford Lighthouse on it. And I will qualify that we were all familiar with the beam of the lighthouse, which people have tried to downplay these events as saying we misidentified. Uh, Airman Burroughs saw what appeared to be an object in the forest, at the east end of the runway, just within the trees. Uh, Multicolored lights, um, it, it, he suspected maybe an aircraft had crashed, but there was something wrong with that. Uh, he called in the Central Security Control on Bent Waters, reported what he was seeing. Uh, a shift supervisor named Jim Penniston responded, he was a staff sergeant, responded to the scene. Uh, a few other personnel arrived. I wasn't involved in this, but this is what I know of it. Uh, they pursued the phenomena into the woods. They definitely thought there was an air crash and when started to begin those procedures. Uh, we were not allowed to take arms off the base due to our treaty with Great Britain at the time. Any incidents outside of the base, uh, the British military or constabulary would take care of. Uh, these men got permission to proceed on foot into the forest to investigate these lights. Uh, according, and there's a lot of information on what they saw. In fact, on uh, the MSN network, Jim Penniston has given terrific statements uh, on the computer, you know, uh, of his experience with Burroughs. And there was a, another airman named Cabanasac there, and then a fourth person, who I don't know whose name that was. They pursued the phenomena. They found that it was not an aircraft, but a triangular object about uh, six feet at the base that rose to a nine-foot point. It was black like glass or fabric, they described it as, uh, great density to it, black. They didn't know if it was on a tripod or on legs of some sort, but it had multicolor lights around it, and each of these individuals have given somewhat conflicting statements as to their perception of what they were looking at. I do know this based on his own testimony that Sergeant Penniston at one point, these men did bring their sidearms, which are 38 calibers that the law enforcement people carried. We carried M16s. None of them were brought to the forest. Uh, Sergeant Penniston drew his revolver when they encountered this object and saw clearly it wasn't a, an ob anything they were familiar with. These were all highly trained observers, as we all were at that time, for aircraft or unusual things. Uh, Sergeant Penniston drew his revolver and aimed it at the phenomena at some point. His, I believe his next memory, and I'm trying to paraphrase here, he approached this phenomena very close to it, observed a panel on its side with some sort of language similar to hieroglyphics. It was somewhat familiar to him, but he couldn't identify the script, and it was raised from the surface. Uh, he touched it and felt the surface. It felt warm to a degree, and the texture of glass almost, the consistency and hardness. Uh, and he, they sensed there was movement within through this opaque kind of glass. 
um, Sergeant Peniston heard a voice, and this is some recent testimony, obviously they feel easier. He's a retired man from the Air Force now, honorably retired, uh, and probably very willing to talk about this on the record. Um, a voice came into his head, so we perceived, and I don't know what it, well, how this went, but from what I understand, he asked the phenomena, who are you? And it responded, we are you. And it gave a number of half a million years down the line and biological things. All this information flew through his head that there was a biological need to come here and all kinds of things. Uh, he probably would say it much better and accurately, but it gives a dimension of the high strangeness of this event. Uh, these men had four hours of missing time. Their radio communication had failed with the base. Luckily enough, some other personnel obviously did respond to see what was happening with these people, and some brought cameras, but observed this activity, much in shock, and snapped some photos. Part of my story, unwillingly, is that in the last year and a half, because of the book I wrote, Left at Eastgate, some of these witnesses contacted me, and a gentleman released some of these photos. They're not spectacular, but they do show light phenomena that needs further work. These men were debriefed the next morning. They were f retrieved, dazed, in the forest. They made statements immediately. Uh, they were debriefed. They were given injections of what were, they were told was sodium pentothal by some element of the Air Force. So uh, Airman Burroughs told me directly, John Burroughs, who lives in the state of Arizona, I'm not sure his location right now, but it is Arizona, originally from Chicago, told me that uh, he knew the next day, within the next two days, that this phenomenon was going to return. And it indeed did. Their shift had ended that day. My shift came on. There was evidence left by this encounter, pod indentations on the ground, uh, the British Suffolk Constabulary responded to this the next morning because it was an incident. It was reported to them from the base security police uh, operations desk. They came and they, these triangular, and Charles Halt can explain this very accurately because he was present on site for the investigation, was that these pods were in a perfect nine-foot separation of a triangle. They represented something two and a half metric tons sitting down. There was a break in the canopy of the Corsican pines where something clearly came through it. Uh, there was background readings, and Nick Pope can actually offer some more information on this via the Ministry of Defense, is that the background readings were 25 times higher than the normal natural background radiation in that area. How these readings came up is that a Sergeant Nevels, who um, was the disaster preparedness man on the, uh, at the base at that time, had the Geiger counters and knew how to read them. Uh, and these readings were taken from this ground zero area. There was residual on the trees and everything. I was put on a very remote post at the end of REF Bentwater's flight line called Perimeter Post 18. Uh, it was alert, an alert man position, so it was normally not manned in this dugout or bunker. Uh, I went to my position, was uneventful for about an hour and a half. What I noticed first was some, an animal disturbance where some deers ran down to a rather low fence we had at that time surrounding the base. And these deer, a herd of deer, jumped the, uh, the fence and ran past my position right over the runway. And they seemed spooked or I had that feeling. Suddenly from the WSA we had an 80 foot tall tower which oversaw the facility, also could see over to REF Woodbridge and the Rendlesham Forest. In that, it's called speak ads, and that's all the electronic monitoring by highly trained specialists and security police, uh, particularly to watch over the ordinance and all kind of stuff. And I started to hear chatter on the open frequencies. We had Motorola radios at that time. We had four channels of security police operational uh, active channels. Uh, I started to hear commentary about lights over the forest toward Woodbridge. Uh, those lights are back again. And I was looking up and suddenly at this point I get a call from um, uh, uh, Lieutenant Bruce England who was a security police officer, former Army uh, Special Forces I think and went into the Air Force, uh, called up and he was the shift commander at that time and said, Airman Warren, deactivate your post, you're going to be picked up by a GOV, which is a government operated vehicle, a truck, and uh, pulled up and uh, Sergeant Adrian, Adrian Vestinza, who is my reporting official, was the driver. Lieutenant England was in the passenger seat and there were other personnel, new personnel like me, in the back. I was told to get in, 
We went immediately to the Bentwaters motor pool. We refilled, we were fueling up Lytles, which maintenance people would have done that. They threw all of them out. They weren't around. There was a lot of chatter about people trying to find the base CO and just a lot of frequencies. They were saying change frequencies, put all the radios down. All of this, I must tell you, was recorded in CSC on the, the tapes they make of that night. Those were stolen and so were the logs of that period that Charles Holt can confirm also. They came up missing in a few days when he went looking at that listed personnel on duty and a lot of different things, incident reports and everything. They were gone. But we had fully autumn, you know, we had our NATO rounds in the weaponry, which is very unusual. Uh, and there was an urgency among senior people. Went down a logging trail into the forest. Uh, there was an armor vehicle after about a half a mile into the woods. Uh, I haven't talked about this in a while because I wrote it and thought I'd never have to. Uh, the feeling in the forest is very strange. Movement was odd. Perception was odd the minute we entered the forest. I will tell you this. There was a, a problem. Something was wrong. Uh, we pulled up. There were some uh, other vehicles. Uh, there was an armorer's vehicle. They took our weapons off us. Each weapon is assigned by number anyway, and it's with you for your whole assignment. And that was taken away from us. We broke up into four-man units. I could, um, we headed down a trail into the forest. Charles Holt was out there at that night with a smaller party of senior people. Lieutenant England joined them at one point. Uh, I saw there was a lot of radio contact. We had to maintain radio silence, the lower ranking guys. But I could hear on other open channels them saying, you guys coming in have to avoid those hot spots. We don't want you walking all over them. I don't know what I'm thinking. Is the forest fire? What's going on? And in reality, they were, it was more site investigation going on at that period. I think they had anticipated these objects return. Sergeant Burroughs, by the way, from the first night knew it was coming back and arrived at the field off duty in civilian clothes, obsessed to get back near the phenomena. You can hear on the actual tape Charles Holt made that night, uh, one of the people on the perimeter securing and access to the forest calling Charles Holt on the radio saying, Airman Burroughs and two other individuals wish to rendezvous at your location. And Charles Howe responds, tell them negative at this time. We'll tell them when they can come out here. We don't want anyone out here right now. Uh, this tape you will have, and this tape should be heard by all interesting parties. Uh, Mr. Hall can comment on, on it further. Though we differ greatly on a lot of perceptions, we are on the same side in a lot of ways. Uh, what I saw is an, you know, I, I, I talked about it earlier. I wish it was much simpler than what it was. We, as we moved through this forest in this small group, I was with Sergeant Bestinza. It was Robert Ball was there, um, shift supervisor, so master sergeant, and uh, a lot of other people. Came to a clearing called Capel Green at the end of the Corsican Pine. And there was a phenomenon on the ground in this field. It was like a mist. It looked like a, a fog on the ground. There was a cinematic film camera, a movie camera present, and there was a very large Agami type video camera. They were very large at that time. These came from public affairs on Bentwaters. There was anticipation of the return of the phenomena. There is a, a trail on this film that is established. Not just This isn't just me talking. Anything I'm telling you I can, can pretty much be backed up in any court of law, and especially with the body of the evidence, and I, I'm willing to do that. Uh, I was observing this, and of course I can describe this in a way, it sounds like a bad science fiction movie, but I will say that my senses were not as they are now, or as they would have been hours before I was present there, and others felt the same. It was like watching a, a movie. This mist was on the ground, it was being observed, there was disaster preparedness present, there was a house off to the left, farmer's house, I'd never been out in this forest before. There was a light on in this house, so those people were home, there was a dog barking, I remember clearly. Uh, I saw a light come in. We could see the beam of the Orford Lighthouse in this clearance by the, clearing, by the way, very clearly. This case has been written off as a misidentification of this lighthouse, an exaggeration or whatever. Uh, in reality, that it was there for over 100 years and was no surprise to anyone. This object, a red basketball-shaped object, came in from the North Sea area over the trees. I thought it was the taillight on an aircraft. It moved so quickly that it was it, it, it came in over the trees. I go to this site all the time and I see it as clear as day. Did a, a downward arc over Capel Green, 
which I didn't know the name of this plot of land at that time, came to a point over this mist. Now, it's been misrepresented. There was a mist on the ground. It seemed, appeared to have structure. It was 50 foot across. This basketball-sized amber light, it didn't seem solid. I couldn't tell you what it was, it was 20 feet above the object, this mist. As soon as I got a fix on that, and everyone else did, but I will tell you the cameras were up on it. These people were reacting, but everything was like hello and very slow. There was an explosion. This is described, it's very hard for me to describe it. It was a, this thing broke up into multiple shards of extremely bright light. I and others suffered, and I have documents of this because I stole them from Bent Waters because an officer advised me to, because he said, your, your military record is going to vaporize as soon as you're gone. Uh, my eyes uh, were damaged, flash burns to the retinas and all. This is established uh, as if I'd stared at an arc welder's torch for about 10 minutes, which is unadvisable. Uh, everything was very bizarre at that point. In the place of this explosion of light, very silent, there was no sound, anything, was a structured solid object, rather large, probably 30 feet at the base uh, uh, to a pyramid type shape, no windows, flags on it, it was very rough, it, it, was, it was distorted as you looked at it um, with a rainbow-like effect and yet through peripheral vision you could get a fix. But all this is dreamlike. I will tell you there is severe evidence for this play, thing where it sat to this day. And uh, this one won't let anyone down this case, believe me. And, uh, and this, this thing was there on the ground and it was filmed and it was photographed. There were some British bobbies present on Charles Hall's tape. You hear the Suffolk Constabulary pull up in the forest with their British police vehicle because their siren was on for a bit. Eh, eh, eh. We didn't have that horn. Uh, and that's proof to me that they were there. These police are unattainable. They won't talk to anyone. Uh, they had a camera and one was taken off one of the British police. Already an international incident was brewing here. Our wing commander, Gordon Williams, who uh, was at a party, I believe, that night for the wing, arrived on site with other senior people. There were British military present. They could have been at the party. And I will say they seemed to know how to deal with an event like this. I have no recollection of any sound emitting from this. It was almost like a mirage. And yet I know it was solid because it left trace and evidence and all, but it was so beyond anything and it's right in front of us. I was at least 30 feet away from it at one point. Uh, too close. There was a life form in association with it and so I can just cut to the chase uh, which we perceived, I perceived, I remember thinking, and you've heard other witnesses say this in my, as children. What are these children doing here? And the mind starts scrambling but they were almost, there was in light, there was bright light and there was movement and these things had a an upper body I clearly saw with, and when I saw an arm, what I perceived to be arms move, I'm like, my, you know, you just, you're in another place at that point. What I saw was on the, le the, the, the right side delta of this bizarre object machine, where this bright light moved out, it was bluish gold, it was about a foot off the ground, it split, and it was only about four feet in height from the ground up, but it split away, and three individual kind of oblong uh, cocoons of light with this thing in it, these in three individual things inside it, people or things. But they and looked like human. Shape they were humanoid. humanoid. Okay. Yeah, they were humanoid. There was... Uh, you know the height of them? Yeah, they would have been about, in height, probably about f four feet, really. I mean, the child, you think of children. The light diminished, and that's where there you could see what was in it. And I'm thinking, it, it, I don't know what I thought really. No, it was hairless, but there was clothing. There was a, an apparatus attached. I can't describe a dark thing, and uh, I could not see the lower extremities uh, because the light. These these were not walking on the ground. These things, and uh, I wish I never saw this. But uh, there was a white membrane around what our eyes, large eyes and the white membrane was moving, adapting. It was like your, your eyes adjusting to light. And uh, the, the thing, it was just doing this, the movement of these lights they are in was just kind of a wavering thing. 
the commander was there, and uh, this is where I, I swear there's got to be a protocol and if in the event of something like this. I don't know. It's a feeling, my opinion. And he moved forward, and at that point, we were called out of the area by rank. In fact, a lot of lower-ranking people were involved in this and sent back to the vehicles. Uh, on our way back, there was a lot of phenomena in the forest. These lights, these light beings or whatever, uh, there were other craft around in the tree, above the trees, uh, almost as if they were guarding this thing and backing it up. And I will tell you that Airman Burroughs, uh, and he needs to be spoken, speak to someone, and he needs to be in, in front of a, a, a responsible body. This man can make a big difference. Uh, was in the parking area where all the vehicles were. They would not let him out to the sites. Charles Halt was pursuing other light phenomena uh, with getting beams fired down to the ground right in front of him. Uh, literally, pencil-sized beams from this, these crescent-like phenomena. Uh, making a recording as it all happened. Four hours of audio, you've got 18 minutes of dynamite. My event was happening about a half mile away. In fact, on that tape, you hear the beginning of my event. I will clarify this, it was on the record long before the halt tape became public and I was the one that made the halt tape go public. And I turned it over to CNN and I've ne never taken a penny for anything I've done with this ever. I never have. As we left, and I will tell you verbatim because Airman Burroughs told me this, or John Burroughs, is that um, this another object appeared right in the midst of a lot of security personnel at the motor, uh, at the uh, parking area where a lot of the trucks were and personnel, that backline personnel, and appeared right in the midst of them. Airman Burroughs grabbed this object and it moved over the ground 10 meters with him holding on to it. It's an absolute fact. He physically touched it. He moved with this thing on it. It took off. It got away from John. Uh, another beam of light came down. Uh, there was one guy, a security personnel, in a pickup truck this thing was following one of these beings in the, the light, literally following him. He jumped into a pickup truck, slammed the door, and it passed through the glass right in front of him, and he freaked and kicked the windscreen right out of the truck. This thing went out the other window. I know this person. This was happened in front of many people, too. Went out the other window, which was rolled up. It's December. Turned away from the vehicle. A blue beam of light came down from above the trees. This thing got on it and ran right up into something that was dark and looked like a pine cone with white pins of light on it. It was uh, dark against the, the night sky above. It was watching over this. Another officer has said that he felt that these objects had been there looking for something. They were conducting grid searches the night before. There were three nights of activity. But they were there for a reason, and it was kind of like, okay, we're here for a purpose. You guys are bothering us, so we're going to show you what you need to show, but we're going to accomplish what we need to do. I will tell you on that night, and this is from Charles Holt himself, on the record, we're off the record actually, but he did say it. We interviewed him at length, uh, but he did tell us this, and my co-author, that he, he said to me, were you aware that on that night, these objects, over, and you hear on the tape, we have one object hovering over Woodbridge Base and Bentwaters, there is a wit witnesses are coming out now saying, unbeknownst to us, there were three massive triangular objects over the base, over the forest, and over the Woodbridge base the whole time. And there was missing time with so much many personnel over this period. It was amazing. Uh, I didn't see that phenomena, but so much to this, it never gets simple. My roommate came in and talked to him. He wasn't working that shift. He was law enforcement. Uh, I noticed I had a shock of gray hair that did fall out, but a, literally a shock of gray hair on the right side. Uh, my eyes were watering profusely. I had a metallic taste in my mouth, and I was almost hallucinatory. I was having the room was warping and everything, and sweating. I was sweating profusely and had cold chills. We had secured phones on the base, obviously, but being rather young and naive, I didn't pay attention to the ComSec rules, communication security. And we had a phone where I knew they'd always listen in on your calls, but I went to a public phone box when they used to have them here on the base, reversed the charges to my mom, and I said, Ma, you won't believe this. I, got, I remember her answering. She does too. So you'll never believe this. Greg was right with me. I said, last night, so I, it was actually hours earlier, I said, last night uh, a UFO landed on the base and we saw everything and you wouldn't believe it. And I'm just thinking, she's not responding. Ma, Ma, she's gone. 
I looked at Greg, I go, oh my God, I got cut off. I called the operator and I said, listen, can you reconnect me? She goes, are you calling from the base? I go, yeah. She goes, I'm sorry, you were cut off from the base and hung up on me. Didn't even offer to her. And I looked at Greg, I said, man, I think I'm in trouble. So we ran back to my dorm. Malcolm Ziegler, who was a major, was the chief of security police. His underling was Major Carl Drury, uh, all involved in one or aspect or another of these events. Uh, Major Ziegler is from West Hartford, Connecticut originally, and we had some common ground. I'd live there. And uh, uh, we got to the office. There was a Jaguar outside. Uh, there was another uh, expensive car. I don't remember what it was now. And I thought, oh, here we go, the debriefing. Well, first of all, there were all the lower ranking guys. There were no people above sergeant in my group. We were debriefed in a compartmentalized way, which I understand now that. I didn't. I said, oh my God, they're going to tell us to shut up. I know it. Because I suspect you heard rumors then of that. You know, it went way beyond that. I'll name names. Uh, there were pers people in plain clothes going in and out of the, the security police law enforcement desk. And that was unusual, civilian looking people. And I'm like, oh boy. Well, we were gone over with a, a, a civilian looking, not disaster preparedness, with a Geiger counter. And they said, did any of you retreat, remove anything from the forest while you're in there? Anything. Rock, twig, anything. They kept asking this over and over. And they said, if you have and are not going to tell us now, you're subject to the UCMJ, all these Article 15, beyond that, Jail, Leavenworth, uh, everything. And we were young. We were all new. We were like, oh, my God, we haven't even started here and we're in trouble. Uh, there was one return on one of the guys, and he something was taken out of his pocket. This guy was removed very quickly, and I will swear on my life, I never saw him again. He was removed. This happened to a lot of people. It led to a suicide that the Air Force is responsible for. This is a real person with a real name. That base, by the way, after that, eventually adopted the highest rate of suicide in NATO. This is an established fact. One of the captains involved was found hanging in his back garden from a tree, married with children, everything. All these people started to shoot, kill themselves. I mean, this is absolutely like the movie JFK, but I lived it. And I'm amazed I got out of there alive. Uh, keep it very simple and focused on me, and I apologize for going mm, off in ways, uh, is that we were brought into the office. There were rows of seats, a very small law enforcement desk, and no one was being held there. The law enforcement operators uh, that day were kept out. The office, it was, everything was different on that base now. Brought in, we were, there were sheets on top of the law enforcement desk. We went in, filed in in a line, there were about 10 of us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven stacks of documents. Pre-typed, one was a pre-typed statement, all generic of what we saw, which was not what we saw. It said we were off duty and saw only un un unknown lights flipping amongst the trees. Clearly remember that. I said, wonder if we don't sign this, uh, Major Ziegler. And he goes, you have no choice. And he goes, I have no choice but to ask you to do this. And I kept seeing these other personnel in his office because we were heading there next. He said, you will sign, I think there were four documents. One was the UCMJ secrecy thing. I forget, JANAP one something, whatever. And that clearly said JANAP. And it was a traditional thing, but there were other things that we couldn't read. You'll be able to read them later. Put your signature on social security number. We were filed into his office. There was a movie screen set up. There were uh, two rows of chairs, metal chairs folded out. Major Ziegler left, and what was looking at me as I walked through were two gentlemen in civilian clothes, big people, very business-looking, American. They had plastic ID with a photo thing, and it said Armed Forces Security Services. I don't know if that's Air Force. We've been told that is a field arm of the National Security Agency. Uh, and they were intimidating people, and they didn't smile or anything. They just, you know, were like, where, what do we do? And they're like this. We were in uniform, and they asked us specifically to wear the uniforms we were wearing in the, in the field. And I think that was for the Geiger counter thing. We sat down, and a naval commander that came from U.S. Navy ONI London, his name was Richardson, and he was a Commander Richardson, was his rank. He had the rings, he was in uniform and was very affable with us. Basically, it went like this. I am sitting next to a friend of mine from Alabama we called Alabama. And Alabama was uh, religiously already at this point so unwrapped that Satan had encountered him. And 
that he had a handheld Bible and was just under his, it was like speaking in tongues, almost reading this. He was gone. And being so young at 19, the human condition isn't apparent to a lot of people and people's pain and trauma, but I was watching my, this guy I knew melting down next to me. He's one guy that didn't make it, and he has a name, and he had a family and everything. Uh, they didn't care about that, but what he did say is that, we were all numb, but this is very clear. He said, in a nutshell, you airmen have been exposed to something that we have known about for longer than any one of you in this room are aware of. And he said like this, uh, it was all matter of fact, there was no hot lights on us. We're just hearing it. I wasn't surprised. And he said, there is a phenomenon that has been coming here for many, many years. Some of it comes and goes. Some of it is a permanent presence. They didn't say a phenomena. They said various civilizations, advanced civilizations. And there was a lot of techie words that I wasn't familiar with, but I put this kind of in my own interpretation. Uh, a lot of militaries. And uh, the re there was a lot of the reasons for secrecy, national security, uh, your best to go on with your lives. And one of, the, one of the guys in the room said, wonder if we say something. And he goes, know this now, your mail will be monitored for as long as you are in the military. To have a good career in the military, and phones, by the way, he said, the best way to go about it is not discussing this with anyone, even each other from this point on. Go about your lives, forget about all this, move on with your lives with the knowing that you have seen something that few people will ever get to see. And he said, and, and he said but the, it was all, and he, every other word was loyalty to national security, our oath, serving the country. And it was brainwashing because all of a sudden it was repetitive lines and there was a drone to his voice. This was brilliant. We were shown gun, they showed a film, they said we were going to show you a film that might help you best put into perspective what you, wear, what you gentlemen have uh, witnessed and help you maybe put it to bed a little bit for yourselves. Uh, we were also told though if any of us have any unusual dreams, we, we were as a number, we were to call daily for the next month. Any unusual dreams, if anyone was trying to pry information out of us, they said that there would be a possibility of Soviet infiltration into the area to try to get information from us. Uh, at that time it was the Cold War and they said be aware of anything, we were to report that immediately. But even if our fellow airmen asked us, well, uh, we were shown a film and they ran the film. I mean, it was just a film on a reel. It was non-narration. He did not narrate it. It began with gun camera footage, what I can only assume from maybe the 40s. It showed some uh, aircraft prop driven, aircraft broad daylight. It looked like Florida Keys with a fleet of silver disco under it, broad daylight, like the movie camera was coming out of the canopy. That was one of the first frames, Korea era. A MiG flying, a lot of Rocky Mountains, a black and white footage. Uh, an object coming by this MiG and the MiG spinning out and hitting the, the mountain and exploding and the camera pulls away and there was a, a howitzer or something and it, people running this way. The clip changes. This thing went all the way up to the space program. The best clip on it showed the beret of the 5th Special Forces, Vietnam on a red clay hill, low scrub brush, guy with a camera, a lot of them had shirts off or whatever and the camera, I don't know if it was Laos, Cambodia or what, uh, I don't even know the year, but it was in color, turn the camera and this giant green kind of delta shaped thing rises out of the brush very slowly and deliberately below where they are up to face level, camera level, and then continues. But shrubbery and brush is falling off this massive thing and a flock of big kind of pelicans or birds go right under it. And I'll never forget that in my life. I remember that better than the incident in the field. Uh, the space program, it showed, and I swear to God, it showed structures on the moon, these box kind of things that look sand colored. It showed that lunar car moving around. Uh, I remember those clearly because I remember being a child when all that was happening, but them at a distance pointing, astronauts pointing at these box looking things, uh, structured objects moving off the surface of, of the moon filmed by definite Apollo missions. And um, what did the structures coming off the moon look like? What shape the structures on, and I, I know this is the moon because it was the Apollo era, looked like a continuation of the color of the moon 
but they were structured to it like huge box kind of things, very square and angular structures without windows or any kind of thing like that, but they were artificial, clearly. And they were being filmed in gray, and then when there were lights and weird things on top of hills, were they in good condition or old? Oh, yeah, no, they looked pristine. And were they looked like giant UFOs moving? Very clearly in different scenes where a lot of it was with the lunar car, uh, that mission. Some of it was uh, uh, the astronauts on spacewalks and something dark coming right up near them with red points of red light. I remember that. All of this is very quick. They never showed it again. Uh, the Apollo is the, kind of the era where it kind of ended. I immediately, after getting back to the dorm with Greg Batram, after calling my mother, her getting cut off, being told by this operator, were you cut off from the base? And I said, were you cut off? And I said, yes, she goes, you were cut off from the base. Click. I knew I was in trouble. I was called to the communications section of Bentwaters. Uh, I knew it was coming. Uh, staff sergeant was there and a captain who was a black man and I know I can't think of his name right now it is in the book and that is his actual name I would uh, debrief man I was asked questions there was a TAC reel to reel present in the debriefing and they kept asking me have you given sensitive information not classified sensitive information out over the over landlines and over and over and I said no no and they said do you want to go with that and I said no I mean yes I was lying through my teeth and they played the tape, and here's me. Hi, Ma, you'll never believe. And they said, they said, Airman Warren, you have to understand, every phone on this base is monitored all the time anyway. Uh, I was told that I, would, I was not given an Article 15, because that's traceable. I would be fined $300, and if I did any other breed, any trouble, I'd lose my stripes. There was a paper trail on that fine and no explanation. And even as late as 19, I never paid it because I got out. I paid, they would deduct some out of my pay. But even as of 1986, they tried to retrieve it, threatening me with the IRS and everything. Madness. They're, they're, they're crazy. They, the machine is crazy. And a lot of guys had been through the event. And Sergeant Penniston was sitting right there. And uh, someone, uh, Steve Longero, asked me, he goes, what the hell happened to us last night? And Sergeant Penniston, who was senior, he goes, shut the fuck up. Warren, shut the fuck up, just like that. And I was like this, oh my God, I threw my tray down and just walked out. It was all downhill from there, my friend. Uh, later that night, Sergeant Bestins and myself, and I swear it happened to others, uh, received a, a phone call. Sergeant Bestinza and I were to meet this vehicle at 5 p.m., that afternoon it was dark at that point in England. Uh, we both walked up. I said, I said, hi, Busty, how you doing? He goes, all right. And we both walked toward this vehicle. The door was open. There was a guy sitting there, but there was a lot of construction material as a barrier where this thing was. In reality, what happened is two people came up behind each of us, and I do remember someone heading toward him, and I heard the sound of what sounded like an aerosol. <laughs> and I went black. But I, my memory conscious for years was that the interior lights of the car were too bright and um, I just blacked out. In reality, it was much clearer. As in the last few years, a lot of that is broken. We were hit with an aerosol of some sort. I literally could see, I could hear, I could not see, and my nose ran profusely and I had my chest got tight. I obviously was not getting into the car properly, so I was beaten, literally hitting in the ribs and pushed and I was resisting and I know Sergeant Bastinza was doing the same thing. I had identified myself as a problem. It turns out years later that he had made some phone calls too. We were taken somewhere on the Bentwaters flight line. I knew this by the sound of where we went. When I was removed from that car, I cut my face because I fell out of it obviously being immobile and hit a patch of concrete and ice. Was lift carried literally bodily face down, and I remember my nose running so profusely and I couldn't wipe it or anything. I didn't know if it was bleeding or what. I know we descended. I will tell you there was an underground facility on that base that is, to this day, if someone would do some work on this, it's there, and someone's got to know about this. But in also reality, I have more memories of it being a very clinical situation. Uh, we do know at this time a lot of people on the base, there were teams in the forest, aircraft came into Woodbridge, that even the commanders of the base had no access to get near or ask why they were there. Teams in white coveralls were going throughout the forest. 
There were intelligence people on the base that were never there before. These are all things that can be established as fact from many other people. But I think also screen memories were given to us because my conscious memory of that is that I would, I'm down, I have 20 minutes of recall and I'm gone for a day and I, it's established by other people. People said I was on emergency leave or on leave or off the base. Other people would verify it. I was just under it. There were other people there. I remember being brought into a, uh, there was a lot of high tech and machinery, huge vaulted glass-like ceilings, uh, panels of glass uh, walls, I, like a subway wall, old but huge glass panels. Uh, we were brought to one area, and I, I have a conscious memory, whether it's real or not, of looking into a very dark void and having someone to this side of me explaining that there were tunnels that connect the bases. There were tunnels from the bases to the North Sea. These tunnels that were lit tunnels, I can still see them in my mind, were massive. And they entered, they led out into the Orford Key, the North Sea, near Lostov. Clearly was told that. And there was phenomena in this huge void that we were separated from, from this molded glass type area with rails. And I believe me, I was on record way before the, all the stuff in the late 80s. I mean, and I never wanted this. And other people were with me with this and have verified parts of it. Whether this is a screen memory, though, I don't know. This could be the MK Ultra. I don't know. And I saw technology down there that they, we were told all kinds of things, but this was non-earthly, non-earth-based technology uh, that they were based there. And I swear to God, I was on way before the pop culture of this with this. I'd rather this not be the case. My, I have another memory of being in a room where there were red aircraft-like seats. We were, I was myself. A number of other airmen were unable to move. I've talked. Uh, heads could not turn, but you could see. There was an opaque screen and somebody, they've said an alien told us this, there was a person or something that we couldn't see or our eyes couldn't focus, and there was a telepathic communication with all of us, but I couldn't hear the other ones. And I've talked to other guys that went through this thing, where all kinds of things about religion, about how religion was, cre you know, the old thing, but was created for us that uh, these things can become human. I mean, they, they, they're, they're in society and all these kind of, I'm like, just, I was gone. And uh, it knew things about me that were uh, personal and um, it was amazing. But I saw other guys having reactions trying to move and no, none of us could. My next memory, conscious memory, I have about 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of conscious recall of these bizarre scenarios my next recall is just literally broad daylight walking out into the sunshine from the base photographic lab. Uh, what did come out, which I don't consciously remember, what did come out was a very terrestrial thing where uh, we were hit with an, aer an exotic aerosol, and I've been told that kind of thing can happen, uh, causing paralysis. I remember a very clinical, I pulled my, I wanted to get out of this situation. Being in this facility, but more on an underground facility, but being in a very clinical like ER setting, being against the wall and then having to sit and wait, seeing a colonel down there, although I don't recognize him, a lot of other people, but uh, a lot of younger guys I went through this with, and uh, being on a table and having Air Force, seeing Air Force senior people and some other unidentified people talking to, down to me. I know I was looking up at them with bright lights and I had marks, by the way, from IV or something when I came out of there, I had the bruise and I had a bandage. I will admit that. Uh, that's for real. I had it. Uh, I'm terrified to know or think of what might have happened. So I've only pursued it a little bit. I wrote my mother a letter. And I wrote the letter two, a week and a half before Charles Halt authored the actual Halt memo, which was gained by the Freedom of F Information. It was a document that reads like science fiction, Air Force letterhead that he wrote it's a minimalization, I believe, intentional, but it reads like science fiction and was released in 1983 through Citizens Against UFO Secrecy based on information I supply them after numerous denials that it existed from the Air Force itself. There's a whole paper trail with that. The site is also the air, part of the site of the 1956 Bentwaters Lake and Heath radar visual contact case, which is considered still to this day the best contact case of its kind 
uh, documented. So there, it has a history already. When it comes to the physical trace evidence to the, uh, the Cape, I don't know what happened to the earlier uh, incident with Burroughs and Penniston because there was a lot of evidence. Pod in, podcasts were made for the uh, indentations. Charles Holt still has possession of one of them. Uh, and does show people this and would show it to any congressional body, I think. Uh, these were plaster casts were made, and I think a couple sets of them. Most of them ended up missing. Uh, but from my night, and also soil analysis was done on that, but it was all s swept away. All these years later, from 1988 to 9, we have done core samples, soil analysis, Many of this stuff analyzed by Springborn Environmental Labs in uh, Massachusetts by accredited scientists. And the results of this, we have the published findings. We will, uh, a lot of it is in Left at Eastgate. There is a further result that did not make it, uh, but it is phenomenal. An uh, phen absolute phenomena took place only in that spot to a, a level of three feet down. And as a layman, all I can best tell you that the evidence scientifically analyzed shows that they, a lot of the investigators ignore the Capel Green site, yet it bears the most fruit in a lot of ways, is that plant alteration, plants do not grow in this one spot, no matter what crop, we've talked to the farmers for 20 years. However, the soil is darker. It does not absorb water. It uh, has a totally almost crystalline, mixed with a, a very dry dirt, uh, like freeze-dried coffee. And I guess some of the analysis that we have the results turn over to anyone gratis is that uh, something sat there at one time. It was in a theoretical way heating the, the soil to a degree in a microwave, industrial microwave oven to a super high heat and then dropping it instantly into a sub-zero freeze uh, in almost a conical direction down. But I do know this for a fact is that Gordon Williams we were told was dead some years ago in 1988 by a fellow flight commander on the base, Al Brown, who was a very good friend of his. Al Brown was one that would tell you, well, I never knew a thing, never heard a thing. We know the whole squadron was debriefed, the pilots and all, but Al trained all of them but never knew a thing, except he heard a few things on the golf course. Very close friend of Gordon Williams, calls him Gordo. And Gordon Williams uh, was gotten off that base so quick because I was his bodyguard at his change of command ceremony in 1981, March. I knew who he was, I'm familiar and I know he was the man I saw in that field. But Gordon Met Williams allegedly has lost his memory from 1984 previous because he was bitten by a bug in the Philippines and was given surgery by the Air Force, uh, the type of surgeons that work on the brain, it affected his brain and he has no recollection before that point because of a bug bite, and I'm glad he made it. When it comes to were there radar returns, uh, on all nights in question, RAF Watton, on the third night, and the first night, picked up, their eastern radar, by the way, picked up an object over Rendlesham Forest, descending into the forest. The next day, U.S. Air Force went to RAF Watton, talked to the air traffic controllers, uh, told them that an alien spacecraft, they swore they were under the official secrets, landed in Rendlesham Forest. Uh, there was contact with the base commander, and they were confiscated, borrowing the tapes. The tapes were never returned. These are all real people that are apparently talking now. I also know that one of, on one of the nights in question, when it comes to where they're beings, a small object appeared near the perimeter of REF Watton, not far from our base. Of course, they had higher security because of the IRA threat at that time. Uh, uh, our, our Royal Air Force Police dog handler, K-19, was doing a perimeter patrol where the dogs went flat down on the ground. These people are talking now. When they saw these two beings near the fence line prodding it next to a triangular object, prodding the fence with these light-like objects, when they saw the RAF dog handlers, they fled toward this machine that took off and headed off toward our base. There was something very strange in the whole region. Uh, there was trackings. The tapes were taken. When people ask about the film and photographs, there's confirmation. This isn't a story I came up with. Uh, Captain Mike Verano verifies on the cable news network program UFO, the Bentwaters Incidents from 1985 that indeed he drove the wing commander, Gordon Williams, the next morning to an awaiting F-15 or 16, I don't know what was available at that time, that we didn't have on the base that flew in specifically. Opened, the pilot opened the canopy. They had a 
satchel with, and he said, I asked Gordon Williams, what do you have in there? And he said, I have actual mo film. We have actual film and photographs of the UFO. Gordon Williams personally handled this uh, material in a satchel to the um, pilot. The canopy closed. I, and he quote unquote says, I on the program, by the way, I asked where the film was going and I was told Germany. That was Air Force Command at that time. From there we know that there was a paper trail that it was eventually sent off back to Washington, back line that way. I was an honorably discharged security policeman. I have an honorable discharge. I've heard a lot of nasty things said about me, but I have my records. The only reason I have my records is because I was advised to take, steal some of them, buy an Air Force colonel or copy them because he said they would vaporize. He said, they're going to fireproof you. I don't know what that means. And I was looked at almost like a Frank Serpico kind of guy. I was not a team player because I was talking to everyone. But he looked at me. This is a guy that should have no knowledge and be going, what are you talking about? You're on crack or on drugs or whatever. And he's like this, you're going to learn. There's nothing you can do about it. So why push it? My friend Alabama went AWOL. AWOL to, uh, back to O'Hare Airport was captured by the FBI. They were intercepted, returned to duty immediately. All he wanted to do was go home. He was put back on flight. Uh, I was riding with a senior master sergeant on a vehicle patrol, just totally depressed with everything. When Alabama called in, this is a real person, called in on the radio and said he was going to kill himself if he couldn't see his go home. And uh, this guy turned the pickup truck quick and was heading toward the post. He said, you stay on the goddamn radio and all this. And there were units. I saw all the units across the flight line responding and everything. I never hear Mr. Hulk comment on this at all. And that's why he won't stand with me in a place because I bring up things that maybe they feel bad about. As he says, the Air Force were on the sidelines for it all. But uh, he had a GIU and a short M-16 and... Uh, in the mouth and took the top of his head off. It was the first time I ever saw death, violent death at 19. And at the, all this did, we were different as night and day being this kid. You know, he was the South, I was the North, he was very religious. I respect that, but nothing in common. He was a nice guy. And his, they did not do anything to help us, calling psychiatrists that played head games. Are you having any dreams? Dreams was so important to whoever we were talking to on these phones. What are your dreams? Do you, or do you feel compulsions to do anything? You have to tell us, and it is dangerous not to tell us. So I went to go back in the Air Force saying, well, maybe I'll do something else. Everything was great. It all began suddenly saying, with the guy that put me in, he goes, Larry, I got bad news for you. He goes like this, we can't touch you. Their computers at that time, word processors would come up when you put my information in. Do not process, nothing follows. I talked to their off in Glens Falls recruiting station, the senior master sergeant that ran it, and he said, and I said, guys, I got to tell you what happened. I told them the thing minus beings and all, and they said like this, Larry, you can't surprise military people with this, and I'm with you. He goes like this, you're never going to get back in. You're more of a threat inside than outside, and he goes, I'll tell you to give it up right now. What well, got me even more mad, and they basically said we we can't go further. I went, they showed me do not process. I'm like, this can't be. I'm honorably discharged. But except my re-enlistment code, and I ask you to check this out, is a 4M. Now, you think it means medical. There is no such existing code on the books, and even Charles Holt said, I've never heard of it. But it has a lot of pull. 4M. It does not mean a medical thing. I got to Connecticut, and my father goes, my father's Lawrence Warren. He was a, a, a highly placed executive in American industry, a decent man. A friend of his, a golfing buddy, was the commander of the Connecticut National Guard. And he says, you want, because I was looking for help with college. He goes, I'll take you up to this guy named Dick and uh, he'll get you. And he said, well, if you want to do that. We went up. Now, this is a friend of my father's. He said, oh, no problem. Not telling him about anything else. A few weeks go by. My father runs into him and he ignored my father. He said, Larry, I can't do a thing. I have had unbelievable phone problems for years, the typical things. We have all the mail. My mail is still intercepted. In this country, it was for years open and resealed uh, with, in plastic with the letters of apology. Many of our packages don't get where they're going. Obviously, uh, my passport was coming up for renewal, and I sent it in. It, was, it would have expired by the time it was coming. But 
soon after sending it in for a new one, I got a letter back saying, Mr. Warren, your passport was altered or mutilated and you need to reapply for another one. I said, oh my God, what the hell was that? So I just feel, I said, oh, fine, filled it out. Next response, have all this, by the way. Mr. Warren, you must reestablish U.S. citizenship. I'm like, what? I'm calling all these people. Finally, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, at the National Passport Center, they said to me, this woman, I got talking to her for three weeks, and I said, she goes, I can't tell you what's happening here. She, but after a while, I said, listen, I'm writing a book called Left at Eastgate. She goes, the Bentwaters thing. She happened to be a person into this, but had access. She called, she said like this, she called me at this number, her home number in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Called her and she said to me, and I have the official printout. This individual passport is being revoked under some classification. Speaking of sensitive defense issues, public forum, foreign soil, and then some coding, DOD coding under it. And uh, there was N NSC things and all. I have it all, and it is just bizarre. Our agent at that time, Perry Knowlton in New York City, was friends with Ramsey Clark, former U.S. Attorney General, who every, you guys know. And he set up a meeting with us, and I met with Mr. Clark in person. Peter first sent him a letter outlining our work and what we were trying to do and what I'd been through, and he said, come in. Now, I was amazed meeting this guy anyway, and he said to me, because I'm going to make some phone calls for you. But so I'm going to tell you this, after knowing everything, in his opinion, and I think he would reaffirm this to anyone, I'm sure he would. He's a very decent man. Because I, and a lot of the debunkers try to say, well, it was because you talked about nuclear weapons, that's all, in a low-level action. Well, Mr. Clark said, uh, he goes, people in England suspect that there were nukes there all the time. He goes, I will tell you this, your passport was suspended because of the other things you've talked about and he wouldn't elaborate anymore. He made two phone calls, and the Department of State, with apologies, said it was an error. We've tried to do our best. I'd be willing to speak and swear to this and everything uh, in front of any congressional body. I have great respect for my country, and I think it is the people's right to know, and a lot of guys suffered through this, and I am an advocate for the witnesses. From other civilizations, that it behoves us, in case some of these people in the future or now should turn hostile, to find out who they are, where they come from, and what they want. This should be the subject of rigorous scientific investigation and not the subject of rubbishing by tabloid newspapers.